Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. Thank you for joining our discussion here today called Thought-Provoking Quotes About Digital Transformations. This is our weekly recording of the Transformation Ground Control podcast, or at least a segment of the Transformation Ground Control podcast. Uh, we release new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms. So this will be a core conversation or core segment within next week's episode of Transformation Ground Control. So thank you for being here for our live production of that of that show and being part of the global digital transformation audience here today. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And with me is Kyler Cheatham, as always. Kyler, welcome to the discussion here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited for this. Me too. I'm excited. And, and what we thought we'd do today is, again, the topic is thought-provoking quotes about digital transformations. And uh, actually, before I get into the intent of the conversation, let me cover a couple of logistical things. I, I'm just so excited. I just wanted to I jump know. right in. You know, it's hard <laughs> not to. Um, I know. But, but before we do that, uh, a couple of logistical things. I already mentioned that this is part of our podcast, Transformation Ground Control. You can go to transformationgroundcontrol.com if you ever want to if you want to look at past episodes of that show. Uh, it's a really good podcast. I'm completely biased, I admit, but uh, it's a good podcast. Check it out, transformationgroundcontrol.com. And you can find the YouTube versions of it as well as all the audio versions uh, on there. Um, but secondly, uh, we encourage audience engagement here today. What we're going to do is we're going to go through some quotes uh, from YouTube videos and blogs and things of that nature that we've published in recent years. And we're going to kind of hone in on these quotes and get audience reactions to it. I, I really want to hear what people think. And even if you if you agree, great. If you disagree, maybe even better. We'd love to hear counterpoints and different uh, opinions here. Um, and then secondly, if you have any, um, if you have thoughts or opinions, please drop them in the chat. We're watching the streams here today. So we'll keep an eye on all of the uh, the chat as we're going through the conversation here today. Um, so be sure to, to check it out uh, or to, to drop anything, any comments you have in the chat. And uh, we'll keep an eye on that. And then speaking of that, if you could just drop in the chat what city and country you're joining from today, we always love to see where the global community is joining from on any given day. So drop in the chat what city and country you're from. Both Kyler and I are in the Denver or the Colorado area. I'm in Denver. Uh, Kyler is a little bit outside of Denver in Grand Junction or outside of Grand Junction, Colorado, um, but love to hear where the rest of the audience is here today. So again, today's topic is thought-provoking quotes about digital transformation. And what we thought we'd do today is really um, simplify digital transformation in some ways. And really kind of, if we could, if we can narrow down sort of keys to success and just a real simple quotes or memorable quotes, um, that's part of what we want to do. But the other part of what we want to do is get a reaction. You know, do you agree to, with this? Let's unpack some of these thoughts and some of these quotes. If you disagree, we'd love to hear counterpoints to it. So we're going to go through a series of quotes that we've pulled from, um, like I said, from YouTube, videos and blogs that we've published in recent years and uh, really hone in and unpack those a bit and bring them to life a little bit. So the idea here is to simplify and to, and to create some discussion here. So I'm really, really excited for, for the discussion here today. So what do you think, Kyler? Should we just jump in and just start throwing quotes up and, and, and get into it? Yeah, let's do this. Absolutely. Why, why mess around? We're not here yeah. to mess around today. We are here. No to, fluff. Yeah, no fluff. Let's just get straight to it. <laughs> why mess around? We could just jump into it. So Here's a quote I'd love to get your reaction from first, Kyler, and then mm -hmm. we'll turn to the audience, see what the audience thinks. But in in order to get what you want to, wow, in order to learn how to talk, I uh, do not start. listen to how I'm talking right strong now. Strong start. <laughs> uh, yes, real strong start here. In order to get to what you want to be in the future, you have to understand where you're starting from. What's your sort of knee-jerk reaction to that quote, Kyler? Yeah, it seems like such a, a simple statement that that seems to be obvious, but so many times this is overlooked when we come to projects because out of the best intentions, many project leaders are so excited about that future state that they fail to kind of uh, um, assess effectively their current state. Um, so I think this is one of those where you see those proverbs where it seems so simple and straightforward, but it's often missed within projects. And until you know that current state and really dig into that assessment, not only on what are your processes, but what is the overall perception of your culture for new technologies too. Um, I know you know this, Eric, but I, I can't tell you how many times we've done something like an organizational assessment of that current state and executives are shocked 
to know that there's an either a perception or a broken process that they didn't even have awareness around. You really have to have that full foundational um, awareness around your project in order to be successful. That's, you know, just obviously my thoughts on that. What, what about you? What are, what are your thoughts on this? I know you've seen it time and time again. Yeah, it, it's it's same as what you said, you know, that dynamic of we're so excited about the future that we want to focus on future state. And and what complicates things even further is when you have software vendors or system integrators exactly. who are swearing by the future state that it is enabled by their technology. So the last thing a lot of a lot of software vendors and system integrators and implementers want to do is focus on what the way you do things today. Mm-hmm because chances are fairly high that there's a conflict between the way you do things today and the way you do things in the future. So the easy answer or the path of least resistance in the short term, at least, is to say, let's not worry about the current state. Let's mm-hmm. let's just focus on that future state. So you you do have to understand that. Plus, plus every organization has strengths, too. I think a lot of us forget that. Yes, we're going through transformation. Yes, we're trying to improve our business. But we also have things that we do really well. It may be painful. It may be inefficient. Um it, it could be even better, but there are things that every organization does that they do well, and you want to preserve that, and you don't want to lose that in, in the name of "quote unquote" best practices. Um, so I, I think that um, so that, I think that's the main reason is you you need to understand where you're at, and, and also you also have to look at the magnitude of change. If you don't understand mm-hmm. how big of a change that this transformation is going to be, then you have no idea how long the project's going to take. You have no idea what your budget is. You have no idea what the resource commitments are. And anything you put behind that is an absolute guess. And that's what a lot of organizations do. They guess based on a proposal they get from a software vendor, whatever the mm-hmm. case may be. So um, anyway, that, that's a few things that, that come to mind there. Yeah. Here's- and I'll just add um, to while we hear from the audience here, the importance of kind of having the infrastructure around the assessment. A lot of times you don't know what you don't know. And so we come in a lot of times as third stage and help kind of provide that infrastructure of how do you actually assess and get good data around your current state as opposed to bias data or what, you know, executives think they want to hear, all of those different things. Um, So really investing in kind of that packaging is so important so that you actually get clean, qualitative and quantitative feedback around your current state. Yeah, absolutely. And that interesting comments here from the mm-hmm. audience. Uh, one comment here on uh, LinkedIn is know your bloodline. I, I think that's very relevant, very, uh, very relevant to, to that quote in particular. Be in the present. That's another mm-hmm. uh, quote. Great quote. Um, my wife says that all the time. She tells me she uh, one of my weaknesses is I do not live in the present very yeah. well. And she always reminds me you need to live in the present. And I think that's true for organizations, too. If you don't understand mm-hmm. where you are and just sort of enjoy where you're at and appreciate where you are knowing that you want to improve. Yes. But if, if you don't understand that and appreciate it, then it can be uh, very, very difficult. Um, another comment from Cindy on LinkedIn, identifying the gaps in the process ahead of time is always crucial. Mm-hmm. Great points. And again, that those gaps are really important. You have to understand what, what gap are you trying to fill? How big of a gap is it? And what is it you're going to do to, to try to try and over overcome that? Mm-hmm. Um, another comment, a lot of great comments here. Thank you yeah. everyone for, the early engagement. I, I myself have trouble waking up in the morning. It's the morning in the U.S., so it's, it's great to see the wheels turning better than mine are uh, from the audience here today. Uh, this is from Eric on YouTube. Eric says, would you agree for companies still on old school companies not to look too far in the future, but to take smaller steps first? Uh, Eric is joining from the Netherlands. Thank you for being here today. Um, I would say yes. If, if, mm-hmm. you, if you're an old school organization or if you have really old technologies and or if you're a risk adverse organization and you struggle with change as an organization, that's okay. I think a lot of us tend to, you know, have judgment like, Oh, that's a bad thing. You need to, you know, there's all this talk in the industry about how you need to future proof yourself. If you don't do the digital transformation now and use AI or whatever, you're just going to die as an organization. There's all this fear in the market that if you don't do it now and make these big massive changes right now, you're, you're just not going to survive. And I think that's complete BS. And I think Mm -hmm. you have to look past that and say, well, look, we as an organization struggle with change. So let's embrace that and let's try and get better at change. But we're not going to change that inability to or that struggle we have with change. We're not going to change that overnight. So let's deal with the cards we've got and, Mm -hmm. and, and move forward accordingly. So I think it's a really, really good question there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of interesting comments where people are joining from today. Um, James from Hereford, UK, uh, just as a few examples here. Uh, Karan from Miami, Florida. Ryan from Denver, Colorado. Jawad from Dubai. 
Sam from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, Marjolaine from Montreal, Canada, Mel from Springfield, Missouri. I spent a lot of time in Springfield, Missouri, actually back early in my career. Uh, hmm. Springfield City Utilities. Uh, that was a client of mine a long, oh. long time ago. It was actually the first project I ever managed, like I was the lead consultant on. Oh, wow. Springfield City Utilities, Springfield, Missouri. It's a, it's a really cool little town. Um, Germany, India, um, Riyadh. So a lot of Riyadh, I'm sorry, uh, Germany, a lot of people from all over the world. So thank you for being here today. Sam Graham, of course, uh, from Spain is here. And speaking of Sam Graham from Spain, he always has great questions. Um, Sam's question here isn't taking one step at a time, getting close to agile. And mm. Sam, I think has watched enough of our stuff to know yeah. what my triggers are. Like he, yep. he tries to trigger me <laughs> in these live events. So like, I can't hide it or, you know, there's no yep. editing this out of this video. Fish hook there. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yep. I fell right into the trap here, <laughs> uh, the Sam Graham trap. Uh, but it is, I guess you could say that's somewhat agile, I guess, to take one step at a time, but I'd say, I, I don't really view it as an agile approach necessarily. I think it's more of an incremental approach. Mm -hmm. which you could use Agile to enable that incremental approach. Um, but I think uh, Agile, in my opinion, is more of sort of an, a general mindset and a general philosophy around how you go through the transformation. Whereas what I'm advocating here, at least for that last question about um, whether you should take smaller changes or smaller steps in the journey, mm -hmm. if you're risk adverse or if you have really old technologies, I think um, that's slightly different, but very, very much over, uh, very much related uh, in that way. Um we're yeah, good. for sure. And agile is one of those words that's so loaded, right? It's often misunderstood and it means a lot of different things. So when we yeah. talk about in in incremental approaches from a strategic standpoint, there's a difference between agile and intentional, right? Understanding your current assessment and being able to pivot from that in a strategic way built around data as opposed to a full on agile approach, especially if you are an organization that is on maybe an older um, technology, which is not a bad thing because it understands who you are. And although software vendors might push you towards maybe cloud-based solutions or emerging technologies, because that makes more money for them, you have to understand what your identity is and what your competitive advantage is to bring you know, what your services and products are to your customers. Um, so I think agile is a very triggering word because it means so many different things, just like digital transformation. Yeah, very true. It's a very overused, vague, ambiguous term. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in moderation, I think Agile can be a good thing. But uh, I think too many organizations use it as a cop out for like, hey, we don't need to document or we don't need to define exactly. requirements up front because we're doing Agile. Let's just go start building stuff. Mm -hmm. so, um, here's mm -hmm. another. Speaking of trigger, I want to pull up a quote that I think if I were to pick one of the quotes we're going to go through today, the one that I think might be the biggest trigger or at least a candidate for biggest trigger of the audience here today. And this is something that I've published recently in a couple of different YouTube videos. Um, very controversial. I get strong opinions on both sides of the spectrum here. It's a lot like politics. It's sort of like putting out a, a political preference. You're going to get a reaction no matter you know whether, <laughs> whether people agree or not. I feel like this is one of those things. And that is monolithic ERP software is dying a slow death. And um, one of the things I've been sort of predicting or suggesting in, in videos and blogs recently is that the incumbents as we know them today, I think will be gone uh, in the not too distant future, or maybe not completely gone. But if you remember uh, Bon or Lawson, you know, those are two sort of old systems that sort of dominated the market at one point and now they're dead, especially if you look at Bon. SAP came along and really disrupted Bon in their position in the market back in the 90s. And SAP has been sort of the dominant big ERP system in the market since then. But I think with the uh, the whole premise of this comment or this thread is that with the proliferation of new technologies, um, different types of best of breed mm -hmm. and interoperability and um, business intelligence, workflow management sorts of systems, there's just so many options out there that organizations don't need to necessarily implement mm -hmm. a core ERP system. And they don't need to get into that money pit and into that big risk that is an ERP implementation necessarily. Um, a lot of organizations are saying, well, let's look at what we've got. And speaking of incremental change, they're saying rather than ripping out the entire guts and backbone and infrastructure that we have as an organization, what if we are a little bit more surgical in our, in our approach to replacing mm -hmm. technology? And so that's where interoperability, best of breed, point solutions, all that sort of thing comes into play. And um, anyway, that's, that's my opinion, but I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear what you think, Kyler, and then of course, what the audience thinks after that. Yeah, definitely. I, well, I'm going to take a full Eric Kimberling approach and say it depends. 
So I know I rarely get to say that. So, I, you know, I really had to jump on that um, overall. approach. <laughs> so I, I think if you have the obviously best of breed solutions and in interoperability when it comes to integrations and the rise of niche systems that help with those integrations, but you have to have the governance in place and the data management in order to make that a good investment. Right. If you don't have those practices of making sure that your data is clean and actionable and that your systems are actually creating integration, that architecture, then a core ERP might be a better option for you um, when it comes to being able to standardize that through a system. So I think the organization, like we were kind of talking about earlier, really needs to take a step back and say, do we have the practices, the internal competencies in place to ensure that we can actually leverage this new best of breed environment through interoperability. And if we can't, maybe we need a system to kind of help us through that in creating actionable reports and data. So I think ideally it's moving towards that, but I would kind of flip it on more, it depends on the organization as opposed to the different vendors um, within the overall um, the industry. So I think that's kind of how I think about it um, and understanding that and moving into this this new kind of environment in which we can create a, a technology stack that is very unique and actionable to our organization, but only if we have the ability to understand how all of that works and create an, a strategy in which we can pull out data that's going to make us be able to make those um, strategic decisions and create that interoperability across departments, not only through the technology, but through the collaboration of the department leadership and the executives. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with the, it depends of course, um, because I always do. That's my answer. To just about everything. <laughs> but I think, you know, you're right. It, it depends on the organization. Some organizations, ERP software will absolutely make sense now and mm -hmm. in the future. And, and I don't think to be clear, I don't think ERP is, quote unquote, dying per se. I don't mm -hmm. think it as a category is going to go away. I don't think SAP is going to go away anytime soon or Microsoft Dynamics or Oracle Fusion or whatever. But I do think their prominence or relevance in the market is going to diminish over time. And I know, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of people really don't like me saying that because they've committed their careers to mm -hmm. SAP or Oracle or whatever. Um, but I think it's important to really just look at what are those threats to that um, status quo. And I think that's what, what we're starting to see in, in the marketplace. However, the audience has a uh, mixed, mixed opinions here. So um, <laughs> this is a really good counterpoint here. I, mm -hmm. And I apologize. Some of the names I don't see on my, yeah. on my streaming software here, but this is from someone on LinkedIn um, says that Amazon prime video recently shifted to a monolithic architecture from serverless microservice architecture. I did not know that. I'd be curious to know why, or sort of mm -hmm. a little bit more detail if you happen to know and can reveal anything that's not, confidential if you happen to work for Amazon, whoever you are. And I apologize again, I don't know your name, uh, but that's an interesting counterpoint that here's an example of an organization, a really nimble, even though it's a huge company, I people I think generally view Amazon as a fairly nimble tech based mm -hmm. company. So it's interesting yeah. to see that they're going sort of the opposite direction from serverless microservices to monolithic architecture. So, and that could be a, a function of scale. You know, yeah. sometimes organizations just get so big that you have to have mm -hmm. sort of that big ERP the monolithic ERP system to, to manage all that data and whatnot. Um, here's a question or sort of a follow-up uh, from the question again from Sam. Does, does best of breed cost more? Um, I'd say long-term it won't cost more if it's a better fit for your organization. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to force fit monolithic ERP and monolithic ERP is not the right answer for you or it's too risky for your organization or you don't control that project well, then that could easily end up costing you a lot more than best of breed. I think the beauty of best of breed is you can sort of grow into the cost mm -hmm. structure a little bit more just because you can incrementally, you know, implement and deploy technologies along the way, which again, back to Sam's earlier point, that's sort of agile ish, um, which is weird of me to say, cause I, a lot of times I say things that are counter to agile, but um, <laughs> that could, that could work for a lot of organizations. Um, let's see what other comments we hear we have here. Um, here's a clarifying question from, mm -hmm. Uh, Mel, I think she's the one from Springfield, Missouri, if I remember correctly. Uh, Mel on LinkedIn says, "If are you saying that there should be different software for each module, like APAR, inventory mm -hmm. management, et cetera, or are you saying that people should build their own UI, thus replacing their ERP? 
Um, I'd say yes, either, either, or, or there's mm -hmm. additional options too. Um, you could have different systems that handle certain functions. Um, maybe not, you, you could go as granular as saying, we're going to have a separate AP system, yeah. a separate AR fun function or system, a separate inventory management. You could get that granular or what we more commonly see is organizations will say, well, we're going to use this software for all of our finance and accounting, which includes the AP, AR, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then we're going to use this other system for supply chain management because that's such a specialized thing. And we need a really deep, robust system that specializes in supply chain management. And then we might have a separate ma manufacturing ERP or manufacturing execution system that handles all our shop floor automation. So it, it just depends on sort of like how, how you want to mix and match. But there's a lot mm -hmm. of different ways you could mix and match. But the two ways you describe, Mel, those are two options of how you could uh, go about a best of breed approach or a non-monolithic ERP sort of mm -hmm. approach. And then the second thing you're saying, are you saying that people should build their own UI, thus replacing their ERP? Um, what we more commonly see there is organizations that um, go with the technology like a Palantir or a Snowflake. Mm -hmm. Those are two examples of two systems or, or another one. Uh, if you listen to our uh, podcast, I think it was last week. Um, yes, it was last week. We had um, two people from a company called System 1A uh, based out of South Africa that's another type of technology. It's, it's more on the finance side, but mm -hmm. it's meant to sort of automate and bring together and fill in the gaps of what ERP systems can't do to provide more depth and more visibility than what a core ERP system can typically provide. So these are oftentimes what, what people used to refer to as middleware. It's sort of like that middleware concept. You're, you're taking technology to overlay on top of your back office stuff um, so that you can have better visibility and sort of automate some of those workflows a little bit better. So, yeah, great and question. I think all those are great questions. And I think it's nice because they all kind of come back to the original question of understanding that current state, right? Understanding what you want to be when you grow up, as you always say, um, Eric, that's really going to depend on should we take a module based approach? Should we take a customization based approach? What should we do as far as understanding what we what we actually want? But those strategic goals and that foundation free from biases, right, is going to be the, the most important piece of understanding what's best for you. Our um, CSO, our chief strategy officer here, Greg Benton, says one of my favorite lines, it's not best of breed, it's best for you. Um, so it's yeah. really understanding what the right system is for your environment. Yeah. Another another quote, good quote. We should have, we should have had that yeah. one here. It's not best of breed, it's best for you. Same with best practice, by the way. It's not best mm -hmm. practice. It's best for the software vendor when they call mm -hmm. it best practice. Another <laughs> quote that might generate some controversy yeah. here, especially amongst the, the software vendors. Um, I have to do a quick plug, Kyler, uh, since we're, we're kind of right in the middle of the conversation here. Um, if you mm -hmm. like this content and you uh, are interested in joining Kyler and I and other thought leaders that are technology agnostic and learn from some of our thought leadership, we're hosting our next uh, digital stratosphere conference in Denver, October 4th through the 6th. Um, we just announced that. I think last week we announced the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the initial agenda and some, some of the speaker lineup, which is still being added to as we speak. Um, but check out stratosphere2023.com and you have early bird pricing until August 15th. Mm -hmm. So um, you save a lot of money if you register before August 15th is what we're trying to say there. So be sure to check that out. Um, look forward to seeing many of you there. So stratosphere2023.com, October, Denver. Denver is very mm -hmm. pretty in general, but October is my personal favorite time of year to be okay. in Colorado. So a uh, great time to visit, if, especially if you've never been here. Yeah, and, and shameless plug, because Eric won't say it, our VIP ticket actually gives you full access to him, the entire event um, in Specialized Strategy and also his book signing. Um, so the VIP ticket has been very popular as you get to kind of go through the event um, actually with him and get that that um, insight. So definitely something we're real excited about, and we hope you all do join us and ask these great questions in person, because it's a really important conversation to have. Yeah, Absolutely. Yep. And you get to sit up close to the band. We have, we have a band mm -hmm. playing one night uh, on the Thursday night. And there's a 80s cover band playing and you get better seating if you pay for the VIP. So that's another uh, perk. And you get to see Eric dance. So uh, maybe uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm more likely to crash Hashtag the stage. It depends. Start... Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I have one to two drinks, I tend yeah. to want to go sing. So I might end up actually on the stage, but uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> the band will kick me out of there probably. Um <laughs> All right. So um, here's a, I'm going to mm -hmm. jump around a little bit in sort of our, our planned sequence of yeah, quotes here, mm -hmm. but here's one that, that I think is important and worth noting. And, and this is another quote um, from one of our 
recent blogs, but don't let the army of tech consultants tell you how you should run your business. Um, and let me maybe clarify this a little bit. First of all, I'm not suggesting you don't need outside tech consultants. I'm saying maybe, first of all, maybe you don't need an, an entire army of them. Um, that's a whole nother conversation of, do you need X mm -hmm. number of consultants on your project? Are you getting value out of that? That's a whole nother thread or, or discussion point. But what this quote is focused on is, yes, you need outside tech consultants, but at the end of the day, it's your business and you have to do what is right by your business. And too often um, organizations have this sort of a, a learned helplessness that they get from not being experts in technology. So they just defer to this army of consultants. Oftentimes the executive team and the project team is completely outnumbered by the army of tech consultants. And so they feel like, well, I've got 20 people telling me that I need to just change the way I do my business and water down my competitive advantage or whatever, because this is the way the software works mm -hmm. and they just end up doing it. And, and you really have to take a more active and a more aggressive role in making some of those key business decisions. And yes, you want to get inputs from your tech consultants, but at the end of the day, it's your business. And there's times where you're just not going to agree or you shouldn't agree with what the tech consultants are suggesting to you. And by the way, there's times where the technology just isn't a good fit for that part of your business and you've got to figure out what the best path forward is. So um, what are your thoughts on this whole thread, Kyler? Yeah, I think I go back to what we covered, I believe last week um, or the week before on ground control, um, when we talk about the Miller Coolers $100 million ERT, ERP implementation failure. And we look at why that failed and because their overall implementation was completely outsourced to external consultants um, without any ownership of the project. So I, I love that you took two approaches here of understanding one, you should have internalized that strategy. You should have a main overall role in understanding and controlling your project. You're the one that is the business owner. You keep it on track. You understand that everyone has conflicting agendas. And that's a lot of times what we come in and kind of coach our clients around is these vendors, whether it's system integrators, whether it's software vendors, whether it's um, external consultants are very good at talking you into what you should be doing, quote unquote, right, should be doing for your own project. It's because, you know, they make a lot of money off of that and they have some sort of financial agenda. Unless you internalize those strategic decisions and take an active role in your project, on both you know, the selection side, the phase zero planning, and then also the post implementation side. And I love when we have different, um, different stakeholders that talk about having the vendors actually take a role in making sure that you achieve the business objectives that you have um, and that you have through the technology. That's so important as well, is how they have a stake in what you want to achieve in the project. So I, I love that side of being able to internalize your project and the importance of doing that. But also the army of tech consultants. So many times we see clients that come to us when they're on, you know, a yellow track or a red track with their project and they're, you know, moving towards a failure and they have no idea what the army of consultants are even doing on their project. Because they just, you know, are submitted with this package with this project and they have 30 different consultants working on their project. And they have no idea what is even going on or what these consultants are billing for. So, again, internalizing that responsibility of you really have to know what's going on as far as what consultants are actually working on your project and what they're doing and are they bringing value. So I think this is one of the, again, simple statements that can actually lead to implementation failure if you are not readily involved and understand what's going on within your project. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to give a quick personal story, when I was, uh, when I first started my career, I started at one of the big uh, system integrator, big five consulting firms or big, Big four now, but back then it was big five. Um, that shows you how old I am. Um, but but it, it was one of the big five firms. It's my first project coming out of grad school. They, they had just hired me out of grad school. This is my first project after my trading, and they put me on this big SAP implementation. And the I remember the company had about 40, 40 or 45 consultants full-time on the project. It was a big Fortune 500 company. And they put me on the project without really a clear defined role. They just knew they had to get me staffed. They had to get me fully utilized. So they put me on this project as a new kid out of college. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I thought I was pretty smart then, but whatever. I didn't know what I was doing still. Um, 
but you know, the whole time I was trying to find work. Like I spent the first mm-hmm. few months just like, Hey guys, give me something to do here. Like I'm getting bored or I've only got 10 hours of work, of work a day or 10 hours a week or whatever. Um, but yet what they did is we would all show up at the client, all 40, some of us, we would show up every morning at seven 45 in the morning and we'd all go in together and we, none of us would leave until like seven or eight o'clock at night. So we were all working, you know, 12 plus hour days. And I probably had an hour or two of work a, a day yeah. at the start. You know, I was really st- struggling to like, give me more work. Like I can get through this stuff in like a fraction of the time I'm here billing. And I felt really bad, but that was just sort of, that's just the way it was. That was my job was to find more work, find more hours, bill more hours. And the expectation was you're going to bill a maximum number of hours. No one ever questioned, by the way, no one ever questioned why I was there. Yeah. Or what was I doing? And someone probably should have, to be honest, someone should yeah. have been questioning that someone, not, not the company I work for, but the client should have been questioning that. Um, but you kind of have to look at that. Not that you want to micromanage every move that your partner makes. You have to trust them to some degree, but you also can say, do we really need 45 people here? Let's look at what they're doing. Maybe we scale that back down to 40 or 35 or whatever. Um, and I imagine for those of you working with big system integrators, there's a lot of downsizing you could probably do, especially mm-hmm. when it comes time for a project to get delayed. Cause a lot of times the initial estimate mm-hmm. is say two years, it's a two year estimate, but it was always going to take three years. Right. And so what they do is they staff up for like a two year implementation when they realize it's going to be three years, they don't scale back and say, Oh, we'll, we'll cut back on our staffing then yeah. to have a slower run. Right. They keep that same run rate or they want to keep that same run rate. So um, that's sort of a, a, a couple of different dynamics behind the scenes that you want to be, be aware of there. Yeah. And um, it's often good for them, right? If your implementation is going three years as opposed yeah. to, right? Because yeah, they get exactly. that, you know, financial bottom line um, to understand that. I think, um, you know, in, in your mentorship, just in in the third stage side, Eric, one of the things that you've taught me is sometimes micromanaging is not a bad thing. And that doesn't come for like our, our, in, our internal team, but it comes for our external questioning of projects, Right. Mm -hmm. So you think of it as like, I want to give trust and autonomy to these experts. But at the same time, this is your project. You're responsible for the budget. You're responsible for the timeline. And you have every right. Right. And I I think if you have questions about your Bill of Rights, definitely go back and watch Eric's um, live stream that he did on clients' rights. Because so many times you don't think that you really have the option to question that. But you absolutely do. Um, Mm -hmm. You have every right to know what's going on in your project and what every single person is billing on and why. Yeah, especially, you know, to your point, Kyler, if a third party has a conflicting self-interest, in other words, they they benefit when you are hurt, um, Mm -hmm. then you've got to, then the only way to manage that is through managerial controls, oversight, governance. I mean, you have to dig into that because you know that party is going to benefit from you extending the duration from two years to three years. They, they financially benefit and they'll tell you all day long, like, Oh no, we would never do that because a referenceable client and a happy client is more important to us than revenue. Okay. Yeah. That's maybe sort of true, but no one's going to turn away money if it's right in front of them and they have the opportunity to make more money right now. Um, That's just human behavior. So you've got to, you've got to, um, you've got to go that route. Um, here's an interesting comment that just came in. Um, it's kind of a counterpoint here <laughs> yeah. uh, from uh, Cameron on uh, LinkedIn. He says, micromanaging is always a bad thing. Um, I'd be curious to hear why you think that, or if you think there's any exceptions to that. I, I don't agree with you on that at all. I, I think micromanaging can be a good thing. I think in in moderation, it can be a good thing. It's more of a, uh, what's that cliche? I always mess it up, Kyla. Quiver in, arrow in my quiver, quiver in my arrow, arrow in my quiver. It's, it's an arrow I have in my quiver. It's a tool in my toolbox. How about that? That's a tool in my better. toolbox I, I can occasionally. I have no idea what you're talking about. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're just as bad at cliches yeah, as I am. Right. Yeah, I do the only know. person I know that might be worse than me. Yeah, right. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stick to the easy one. Tool in the yeah. toolbox. I've got a tool in my toolbox. I can use it sometimes. It's like a hammer. I'm not going to use it all the time, but sometimes I will. And I think that's what micromanagement is. I think micromanagement is absolutely not cool. They're not teaching it in mm-hmm. business school. Uh, even when I was in business school, it wasn't a cool thing. It was all about decentralization and flat organizations and trusting people, servant leadership, all that stuff. That's great. But it, there are times in in the case of conflicting self-interest, you do have to micromanage at times. It's sort of that trust but verify mentality too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'd love to hear, uh, Cameron, even though I'm saying I disagree with you, I'd love to hear your kind of counter to that or why you think it's a, a bad thing or sort of what you've seen. I'd love to hear your, your uh, follow-up there. Here's a really nice comment um, from LinkedIn. Great voices and natural vibes coming from you guys. Well done. Hashtag it depends. I love it. 
yeah, it's going to start absolutely. trending on on the Twitter and the, and LinkedIn and it's uh, my one goal. It's threads or it depends. <laughs> right, or it's not Twitter anymore. It's X, I guess. So I can't keep up with X, Y, Z. Yeah, whatever. Elon Musk, is, Elon Musk is all over the place. I don't know what he's doing, <laughs> but he's he's a genius, I suppose. Yeah. Um, here's another just more of a fun comment from LinkedIn. Interesting, but still, digital transformation is not used to its simplest and fullest form people make digital transformation more and more complex. I totally agree. I think that's mm -hmm. part of why we wanted to do this topic is like, how do you simplify digital transformation? How do you simplify some of the tenets of transformation down to some really simple concepts that you can remember and, and sort of incorporate into your daily lives? But I think too often we get all hung up and caught up in the technology and mm -hmm. let's deploy AI, let's do agile, let's, uh, I don't know, let's, do, let's just deploy all these new technologies that we, there's no way we're going to do successfully when we can't even get basic financials in place or whatever the case may be. So I think it's sometimes okay to be simple and, and like mm -hmm. focus on the fundamentals of the business and the people side of the equation and maybe simplify, especially on the technical side of things. Um, let's see, there's a lot of questions here. So bear with mm -hmm. me. I'm just trying oh, to no. deal with it. Here's here's one that I know is a, a personal interest to you, Kyler, a, a topic that I know you enjoy talking about. So maybe I'll see what your thoughts are here. This goes back to the previous mm -hmm. thread about ERP, monolithic ERP, potentially being dead. This is from Sam on LinkedIn. Not Sam Graham from Spain, but a different Sam. Sam Murali. Murali? Murali. Um, how low-code, no-code softwares are merging? Are they a threat to ERP software? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, low-code, no-code software can be a threat to ERP, quote-unquote. Um, but it again... It depends on the environment that you're working in. Um, so we have a we have a series on um, no code, low code software on our YouTube channel. So I definitely encourage you to go over there and watch it and comment. I love to hear kind of what um, your thoughts are, and that's the importance of this platform is dialogue. You know, and not everyone agrees to the the point of our our last topic of conversation, and that's the important part: is the sharing of those diverse ideas, as opposed to one main thread of how you have to do things. So when it look when we look at low code, no code software, it can be a great opportunity for things like higher user adoption or being able to get those business technologists that might not be the most technical users on a platform to engage in things like employee collaboration um, or having those, those conversations across departments. Low-code, no-code software is also great for reacting to the marketplace when you need to build an application quickly and um, deploy it in an environment in which is going to maybe service your employees or customers. There's great opportunity there. It's just understanding that low code, no code software has some considerations. It cannot do all of the things that an ERP software can do. It's not as um, proficient in many things. So in ways, it can really streamline things like employee collaboration, as I mentioned, or different activities that can be modular based, things like in marketing design or generative AI, um, those different pieces. But when it comes to how you use it, again, you need to really have that governance of where does this make sense in our business environment and where do we need something that's a bit more sophisticated and how do those integrate and talk to each other within that technology stack. So again, that project, or I should say IT governance is really critical to understanding all the different systems. The last thing I'll say on low code, no code software is a lot of times we look at things like cybersecurity and we see cybersecurity breaches from the best intentioned employees that are just trying to utilize technology that um, you know they might not understand is creating a gap within the security. So having a very sophisticated cybersecurity strategy that really audits all of your systems and how they interact with each other is absolutely critical when looking at these bigger user, more diverse local platforms. Um, but I'd love to hear from the audience because this is really something that we're still in case study mode, right? We're still studying. We're still collecting data around how does no code or low code software integrate with enterprise operations and technology. So the importance of putting those comments in there is we actually are able to take that as um, qualitative, um, actually case studies and put them into our blogs and our thought leaderships to help ensure that these types of new emerging technologies are activated in a way 
that is safe and sophisticated um, for our, our client community. So uh, definitely a good question. Of course, would love to hear your thoughts too, Eric, on what that looks like. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, low code, no code is sort of a response to a problem in the industry historically, which is mm -hmm. customization, you know, too, too often uh, companies were getting into trouble because they were customizing software too much, they were forcing software to do things it was never meant to do, and then they were failing as a result. So low code, no code is sort of a response to that and giving um, organizations better tools and options to be able to change mm -hmm. the software without changing the software, if that makes sense So giving them more tools to really do more advanced configuration is really what it is. It's, it's your, you're allowing configuration without having to customize the code itself. Um, and that sort of minimizes the idea is that you minimize the, the risk of, of customization by doing that. I think the other thing I'll mention is that, you know, low code, no code applications are becoming a standalone category of their own, but mm -hmm. big software vendors are also building in low code, no code options and tools into their core offering too. So I think it's something that's going to sort of permeate into technology in general and, it probably won't be a standalone category for long. I think eventually it's just going to mm -hmm. be sort of the way it is uh, in the inter enterprise tech space. So I totally agree with that. A um, couple, uh, I'll be curious to hear what the, what the audience thinks here on, on mm -hmm. low code, no code, but just to come back to a couple of follow-up comments. Um, this is from uh, Cameron on LinkedIn says that my, this is back to the micromanagement thread. Um, I asked, you know, why do you think that is? Why do you think micromanagement is always a bad thing? And he says it shows insecurity. Um, that may be true, but I would argue that mm -hmm. if you're a CIO or a project team member, you should be somewhat insecure because exactly. you have a bullseye on you and you, you are under a lot of pressure. So you should act accordingly. And um, if you need to micromanage, then micromanage. If, if, and if it turns out you were wrong and you micromanage and there's nothing to see here, which I don't think will be true for many of you, if any of you, but if that is mm -hmm. true, you can always back off and do less micromanagement. But if you don't micromanage, mm -hmm. the, the consequences are pretty, pretty severe. And there are times where you need to, but he does also follow up and say, uh, now you're now saying to be used as an exception to that. He agrees. So I think, so we're kind of saying the same thing. Don't micromanage all the time. Use it as an exception as a, as a, whenever you need it, but not all the time. Uh, back to the thread about um, consultants and not having control of your consultants. This is from Colin on LinkedIn. Colin says, we also see many digital transformations being overloaded. It will fail to realize that small projects are more successful. We focus on sizing using formal standards to manage this. Your thoughts? And I'd say, yes, I'd say in general, mm -hmm. smaller, more incremental projects have just a higher likelihood of success. There's less risk. It doesn't guarantee success, but you are more likely to be successful, which is why so many organizations break their projects into phases. They don't try to do the mm -hmm. big bang approach like they were trying to do 20 or 30 years ago. They're, they are doing more of a big bang approach now, or I'm sorry, more of a phased approach now, more of an incremental mm -hmm. approach than they have in years past. And I think that's a, that can be a really powerful, effective way to do it. Um, let's move on and, and you can keep commenting in the, in the thread. I'll come back to, even if you're bringing up a, yeah. a quote we already covered, but just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll uh, kind of move on to a couple other, um, threads here. This is sort of in the spirit of control and ownership that organizations oftentimes fail to have. And this is also in the spirit of software vendors having too much mm -hmm. influence over the way businesses run their business. And the quote here is, don't let arbitrary software end-of-life policies dictate if and when you upgrade technology. And this is one I feel really strongly about. Again, it's that learned helplessness that organizations often have. And they say, well, SAP is telling me I have to be off ECC by 2027, mm -hmm. so I better go do a big, huge S4 HANA implementation right now because they're telling me I have to. Or, you know, it's not just SAP, by the way. It's also Microsoft. If I'm on Microsoft mm -hmm. Great Plains, I've got till whatever it is, I don't even remember, 25 or 27 to get off Great Plains before um, I need to be on D365. And a lot of the software vendors are doing it. There, A lot of them are guilty of this, but it's really frustrating to watch as a tech agnostic consultant because it's mm -hmm. super reckless. I mean, I think it's a reckless way to do business. Um, I think it's highly unethical to be telling, mm -hmm. you know, holding a gun to an organization and saying, you need to get off the system because we're not supporting it anymore. And guess what? We've got all your data in the system. We're not going to maintain it anymore. You're on your own. You need to do a big upgrade. So you're basically, you know, holding the gun to the head of these organizations and making them walk the plank, you know, into a in, into a digital transformation, whether they like it or not, or whether they want to or not. So, our advice to clients is: do what you want. If you need to be on an old mm -hmm. system that's no longer supported, then maybe that's okay. That risk act could actually be lower than going through a big transformation. For many of you, it does make sense. You you should have been off that technology ten years ago anyway. You might as well, you know, jump in and, and get it done 
because you've been putting it off for too long anyway. So it just, again, it depends, hashtag it depends. And, and I think you as an organization have to be just deliberate in terms of what your strategy is. And okay, you take it into account if they're not going to support the product anymore, if the, the software vendor is not going to support the product anymore. But that's a risk, uh, just like the risk of going through a digital transformation. So you assess that risk, you weigh the risk, you decide what the best, for, best path forward is for you, and you do it on your timeline. You don't necessarily let the software vendor tell you, you know, what, what's right or wrong for your business. So what are your thoughts, Kyler? Yeah, I just had an idea is we should actually read some of the hate mail sometimes <laughs> <laughs> we get um, because they, they are funny. I mean, you you look at uh, just the, the different emails and things we get from vendors that are so angry that we talk about there might be a different option when it comes to end of life. And a lot of times it's unfortunate, the clients that come to us to say, we have to move off of this, we have to move off of this because of that pressure that they've had from their vendor communication. Um, and it's it's not true. You, you certainly don't have to move off of that if that's what's right for your business and that's what's working for you. And a lot of times that's why we kind of have to reset. But our most controversial um, content that we put out comes from end of life conversations mm -hmm. because it is so lucrative for clients to upgrade. And I will say, when you're looking at going to a new system, doing a full on evaluation of should you go with your incumbent system or is there a different approach is so, so important. So making sure you have that full evaluation phase and putting the time and resources into understanding that as opposed to just saying, oh, yeah, you know, we'll quote unquote upgrade to this new system. It's not an upgrade. It's a full on new implementation that takes that intention and that strategic approach and the resources to put that in. So a lot of times they make you feel like it's just flipping a switch and then you're in the situation where you implemented a whole new software system and you had no idea you were doing that. So that's one of the, the pieces of the industry that I think Eric and I share the mission of really unpacking is what does it mean when you're pressured or pushed into a new system that might not be right for you or might not even be the best choice for your evolving business. So both of us are very passionate about talking about this. And, and I think reading the hate mail would be a, a funny thing to do at one point. It would so. actually it would be just like how on this podcast we've done mean TikTok comments yeah, before right. and uh, we kind of read those and uh, sometimes there's you know nuggets of wisdom in them and sometimes oh, yeah. they're just flat out mean but uh yeah. but one of the uh blogs that you're talking about was written by adam from our team who mm -hmm. wrote a blog about uh the microsoft great plains end of life and this is probably the most controversial blog we've published and i've gotten so much hate mail and escalation to me on this it's fascinating to me but basically what he did is he wrote a blog at the time Microsoft had announced the Great Plains was being decommissioned, I think, in 2025. But they've since pushed the date to 2027. I might have the dates wrong, but the point is, whatever the date was when we published the blog changed to two years later. And so mm -hmm. we put a little disclaimer. We, we updated the blog and said, just as an update, Microsoft has changed the date to 2027. But yet we still got so much hate mail from different Microsoft partners and bars saying, you need mm -hmm. to take that blog down. It's wrong. And we said, no, it's not wrong. We updated the date. Microsoft is the one that made this decision. It's not us. We're not just out there mm -hmm. making stuff up. This is a policy or a, a mandate from Microsoft, and we're writing about it. And we got so much email about it. Like, well, still, you need to take that down. We made the update to change it two years later. Still, you need to take that down. And we had legal threats. I mean, they were threatening to sue us and stuff like that. No one's tried suing us yet. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just bizarre to me that, you know, you want to you wanna shoot, the, shoot the messenger rather than shoot the message itself, which is yeah. Microsoft is decommissioning Great Plains, is going away, and you have no choice but to get off that system. If that's mm -hmm. wrong to say, I don't know what's wrong with this industry, and I'm maybe even more jaded than I than I realized I was. Um, yeah, and the funny part about that is we didn't like get that information off the internet. We we had clients call us mm -hmm. and say mm -hmm. my so and so had called me about that. Um, but yeah, even one of our Google reviews, I think, says Adam puts the cheat in Cheatham, oh. which my father-in-law hates when people say. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's one of those things that that's just where our position in the industry is is looking out for our clients and being able to kind of break through the barriers of having that conversation, which is a really healthy conversation 
um, to have. And if you disagree with us in the comments, I think that's great too, you know, in, in just having the dialogue around what's right for the business. Yeah. Yeah. And software vendors generally don't like that they can't control us. And that's why we started the company was to be tech agnostic, to be exactly. the client's advocate, not the software vendor's advocates. Um, and software vendors don't always like that. Uh, but here's a comment. Sam hits the nail on the head here um, mm -hmm. with this comment. Uh, Sam on LinkedIn says, did vendors learn from Y2K that clients can be frightened into doing something? And that is absolutely it. It's This is Y2K version 2.0. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't, if those of you that don't remember, maybe you're not old enough to remember Y2K. Um, in 1999, everyone was freaking out that when the year 2000 happened, all the systems were going to crash. All the legacy systems were going to crash because they only had the two digit year. You know, so when it, mm -hmm. when it went from 99 to 00, zero all the systems were going to crash and the world was going to end. Basically that was sort of the, the fear and I'm exaggerating and, and simplifying the, the um, sociological uh, reaction to Y2K. But in the midst of all that organizations were on this mad dash to replace all their systems by Y2K. Mm -hmm. they were, they were genuinely worried about that stuff and there might've been some truth to it, but then Y2K happened. And what's interesting is I can't cite or remember a single blip at all. And you'd think like someone somewhere must have failed. Their system must have just completely crashed because they didn't upgrade in time or whatever. But guess what? Nothing happened. So it makes you mm -hmm. wonder, like, was that all just made up by the tech industry, this whole fear of Y2K? And the same thing's happening now, and they're all doing it in parallel. They're all the software vendors mm -hmm. saying on-premise is dead. We're, we're killing it. You've got X number of years to get off that. You need to move to our cloud solution now. And, um, you know, software vendors, again, back to self-interest. Software vendors make more money on cloud and SaaS solutions than they do on-prem. Um, it's more scalable for them. Investors love it. They get better multiples on their valuations if they have SaaS and cloud recurring revenue. Um, so again, it could be the cloud is right for you. SaaS is right for you. An upgrade mm -hmm. is right for you. But you also have to just take what the vendors are saying with a grain of salt because it, there is self-interest on their side too. So um, that's uh, a great point that Sam has there about Y2K. Um, let's hit one more before we wrap up and it's going to be hard to pick one here, but, um, I know. There's, there's a lot we didn't get to. We, we might have to do a part two of this because there's, um, so many we didn't get to. Um, I'm going to cover this one just as more of a sort of a, not a closing thought, but it's, it's more of a, if you're in the midst of a digital transformation, here's a, here's a quote that might help you. Mm -hmm. uh, if your digital transformation is project is in trouble, it's okay to pause while you fix what needs to be fixed. Um, too often organizations get into trouble, project goes off the rails, project gets sideways for whatever reason, and they just keep going. You know, they, just keep, they keep at the current run rate. They don't change their strategy. They don't pivot. Software vendor or system integrator reassures them everything's fine. We'll get it back on track. Don't worry about it. But at the end of the day, you're the one that has to live with whatever the consequences are. And so um, we, we've had one client in particular, one of our bigger clients, who I thought did a really mm -hmm. good job of doing this. They, they, um, we've had a couple that have totally paused their projects. Actually, just recently, we've had a couple clients who have completely paused their SAP S4 HANA implementations um, because they just aren't going well. The software mm -hmm. is not mature. They, they didn't realize the, the gaps and deficiencies in the software until they got into it. And so they paused it to figure out what the path forward is. But we've had another client who didn't cancel or pause the project necessarily, but they totally throttled back with their system integrator. They, they actually, back to the first point, we the first quote we were talking about, about having control of your consultants, they had control of their consultants. They said, okay, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to slow down this, this run rate. We're going to slow down our, um, we're going to deliberately extend our duration because the, the change was happening too fast and they weren't adapting well to it. So they throttled back and scaled back like in half their, their uh, consultants and their system integrator. System integrator did not like that at all. And they thought, you know, it was the worst decision ever, but it was absolutely the right decision for the business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, it's just important. It's maybe a broader point here is it's your project and keep control of the project. Like you're responsible for, for managing the project, not your system integrator, not the software vendor, that sort of thing. So what are your thoughts, Kyler? Yeah. And I think when, when we talk about the most expensive part of a digital transformation, which is all often the, um, actual fixing of a failed implementation, cause we shared a new stat. Um, a few weeks back here on Ground Control, that 84% of digital transformations fail, which is humongous. So when you think about fixing a failure and undoing things that have already been done, that's extremely expensive. Not to mention, we just talked about fear, right? We talked about and we, some great comments here um, about the power of fear. It's 
if your fear of actual implementation and you have to overcome that fatigue or failure within your overall perception in your community or organization, that's huge to have to go and climb that mountain. So if you stop and you show the intention behind, all right, so we, we might not be, we might be in the yellow and we need to take a step back and look at where are all of our budgets are being allocated, what's going on, take a, a project health assessment. And a lot of times that's what we're called in, in implementations that might be veering off the tracks to say, hey, you know, can you assess what's going on here? And because that CIO or that project leader had this security, right? We talked a little bit about insecurities around micromanagement, had that ability to stop and be mindful about where is the project going? I need this independent and agnostic assessment to see wh what is the health of my project? What is the overall assessment of my project? Um, and then being able to say, all right, we need to stop and kind of reevaluate is going to save you so much not only money, time, resources, but also overall fatigue of your implementation staff or your overall culture of believing that you have their best interest in mind. Mm. So many layers to why that's so important. Yeah, no, great, great point. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. I think it's uh, just having that control and and uh, not viewing it as a negative thing if you, um, if you, are met with some resistance from your outside software vendor or oh, technical yeah. implementer or VAR, you just acknowledge or, or prepare yourself. You are going to get a negative response mm -hmm. to that. And that has nothing to do with whether or not it's the right decision for your, for your organization. So um, again, it's sort of like just having the confidence, you know, I think that's what a lot of what a lot of organizations are missing is, is uh, confidence. And in fact, I have a, a video that I shot batch that'll probably come out in about three or four weeks. That's uh it's called my Tony Robbins moment. And so it's my attempt to be Tony Robbins to organizations and say, here's what you need to do Ooh. to get your head straight and to be motivated and to just be confident because so many organizations lack confidence. They just, again, it's a learned helplessness. They don't know what they don't know. They defer way too much to the outside third parties and they lose complete control of the project as a result. So it's my attempt to motivate people to take control and be in charge. And so um, that's uh, something to look forward to as well. Um, yeah, well, good. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about. I appreciate everyone's, uh, comments here. A lot of, a lot of great comments here about all these quotes and, uh, we'll have to do a follow-up of this, Kyler. I think this would be a good topic to yeah. part two of at some point in the near future. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today. This uh, recording will become part of transformation ground control podcast episode that gets released a week from tomorrow on Wednesday of next week. Um, so be sure to uh, check it out there. Um, we do this live production of the podcast every Tuesday, same time, same place. Thank you for being here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on our weekly uh, podcast. So thanks, everyone. Thank you for doing this with me uh, today, Kyler, and to the audience for the yeah. great questions and, uh, and audience questions. And uh, have a great week. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. All right, take care.